a great song, Because He Lives. And that's why we take this day and honor this day to celebrate the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ because He lives today. Because of that, we have assurance of the future. We can face tomorrow, even though we may not know what it holds, because He lives and our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, thank you for being here this day, and may God bless you from the singing as well as from the scriptures that we will uh, read and perhaps from some of the things that I might be able to say today. So we're going to look at a few scriptures from the Gospel of John and also from the book of Isaiah, chapter 53. Our title for today is simply, You Matter. You Matter. Now, you say, what's that got to do with the resurrection? Well, let's just kind of see how all this fits together today, okay? So, in the Gospel of John... When you're reading through the Gospel of John, you come to chapter 13. Now, last week we talked about chapter 12, and it began six days before the Passover. Chapter 13, actually chapters 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17, all happen at the Passover supper. Okay? You know, mealtime is a great time for people to be together. It's just a wonderful opportunity for families, friends, whatever, to just take a few moments, and as they're eating, they have an opportunity to kind of let their hair down, be themselves, talk about things that they might not otherwise talk about. It's just good. It's, it's really good, especially for a family. Here, Jesus and the apostles come together, sit together for the Passover meal. The Passover supper begins after sundown on the day of this. And here Jesus and his disciples are gathered together. And these chapters that I've mentioned occur during that meal and shortly thereafter. So the, what, what you read in uh, John 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17, what you read there all are all things that take place within just a few hours before his arrest and trial and crucifixion. These are some of the last words, that last instructions that Jesus has for his disciples. Now, I'm not going to read all of these scriptures. I'm simply going to refer to the ones that you'll see on the screen there. I do want to mention the beginning of chapter 13. Chapter 13, and I'm not reading these scriptures, but I think we're all probably familiar with them, is where Jesus takes a moment during that Passover meal, grabs a towel and a wash bowl and washes the disciples' feet. You're familiar with that story. To each one, he just goes washes their feet. I don't know if any of you have ever been in a foot washing service or had anything like that. It's, a, it's an interesting experience. I will mention that. If you have not tried it, you, you, you should try it sometime. Uh, at least once. <laughs> but anyway, that's, that's what occurs. And he has some words after that uh, talking to the disciples about being a servant and expressing the idea that here he, the Lord, actually uh, 
came to that place that he washed their feet as a servant. Good advice. He talks about some other things, and in chapter 13 and verse 34, he makes these statements. Now, he's saying a lot of things these last few hours, but here in chapter 13, verse 34, Jesus says to them, A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another, as I have loved you, that you also love one another. And in verse 35, a simple statement, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one to another. A great statement. A great principle a great commandment or instruction, whatever word you want to use, Jesus gives some valuable words here to his disciples. <clears throat> he says here, a new commandment. But this is not new. If you go to the Old Testament, you read in the scriptures where the two great commandments, one was to love God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And then in Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 18, another statement, love your neighbor as yourself. Those were two foundational statements or commands from the Old Testament. So this commandment that he gives here to love one another is not new. It's not foreign. It's not strange. It's something that all of the apostles, all of the Jews at that time had learned from even a small child that this was an important part of life. Loving others. So what is new about this commandment? It's not the fact that we are to love each other, but notice how Jesus puts it in verse 34, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you. That's the key. That's the difference. That's the new part of it. Jesus has just demonstrated to them with the foot washing the idea of being a servant, he's demonstrated to them the idea of loving and accepting another, uh, each other. There was a historian that wrote in the first and second century, and he was writing about Rome, which was in charge at that time. And Rome, the leaders, Caesar and all of that, had become worried about this new thing, this Christian thing, this Christianity. And so they actually wanted to investigate this and they sent spies to see what was going on. And so the spies came back with this report. These Christians are very strange people. <laughs> Do you like that? Eh, we're a little, we're a little different. I wouldn't go to the extent that we're strange, but we're a little different. These Christians are very strange people. This is first century stuff. They meet together in an empty room to worship. They do not have an image. They speak of one by the name of Jesus, who is absent but whom they seem to be expecting at any time. And then they conclude the report, and my, how they love him and how they love one another. That is what Jesus was bringing to their attention, and he emphasizes Verse 35, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples. It's not by our creed. It's not by our denomination. It's not by outward things that people recognize us as Christians. It is a love for one another. 
a love demonstrated by Jesus and He gave the example loving people as they are. You know, we live in a time when a lot of people do not even admit or, or uh, state that they are part of any religion, any group, anything like that. They, they want to be, uh, they, they believe in God, they believe in prayer, they, they believe in spirituality, whatever that may mean. That's a, that's a big word today. But they don't want to be part of a group. They don't want to be part of anything formal or anything where others are involved. They, they want to be kind of isolated. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with, with being private. In fact, there is a, there is, in fact, he just wrote this recently, a cardinal, Timothy Dolan, who is the Archbishop of New York, and he made this statement. I really like this. Faith is deeply personal, personal, and it is. Your faith in God is between you and God. He goes on to say, but it isn't private. By its nature, faith is communal or a community. Think about that. When Jesus said these words, he was bringing us together as a community. He was bringing us together as a family. And every part of this family of God is important. Every person in this family matters. But we are part of the family of God. Yes, your faith is private. Yes, it is personal. personal but it is also part of God's family. And you and I are part of that uh, of that family. Now, it's not our thinking, it's not our creed, it's not a, a, a system or a list of beliefs that bring us together. It's something else. It is the blood of Jesus. That's where Jesus is leading these disciples to what's about to happen in the next few hours. In the book of Isaiah, the other scripture I wanted us to look at this morning, in Isaiah chapter 53 and verses 5 and 6, listen or look at these scriptures. This is talking about Jesus. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. That's what makes us a family. That's what we unite around. Not because we all have the same thinking, not because we all have the same political beliefs, not because we all are on the same social economic ladder. It has to do with the blood, the sacrifice of Jesus. He goes on to say in verse 6, All we, like sheep, have gone astray. I don't know about you, but I've gone astray at times. All we like have, sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him, Jesus, the iniquity of us all. So it is by his stripes, by his wounding, by his sacrifice, by his blood that brings us together, that draws us, that unites us. This love that we have for another person, for each other, this acceptance, you know, that's, that's what people need today. That's what people want today. 
to just be accepted. We all know that we're like Isaiah described. We're like sheep that's gone astray. We've turned our backs. We've wanted to go our own way. We all understand that. We all understand, I think, that we have sinned somewhere down the line. Maybe more than once. Maybe a lot of times. And it is that love, that acceptance, that no matter who you are, what you've done, where you've been, or how you are, you're accepted. You're loved. And that is by the blood of Jesus. And then, the other passage of Scripture that I want to look at, again in the Gospel of John, chapter 14, again the words of Jesus, again just hours before His arrest, trial, and crucifixion, still speaking to His disciples, still giving them some last-minute words, He says to them, John 14, 27. Peace. What a word. Peace. I leave with you. You know, there's not much peace in the world today. You don't have to look far to realize there's not a lot of peace taking place. There's a lot of countries where there's not much peace with each other countries. You know, we look at our world situation today and we see ourselves dealing with some issues in other countries. Within countries, there's not a lot of peace. Within lives. I don't know about you, but there are those days, perhaps you experience those, there are those days that I don't have much peace. Whatever may be going on, of course I'm that age you know right now where it doesn't matter as much as it used to a few years ago. But, uh, you know, sometimes we get wrapped up in what's taking place in our daily lives and it robs us of that peace. It puts us in a state of turmoil. It, it, it turns our world upside down. We become anxious. We become nervous. We become worried. We become fearful. And that can be from a lot of things. Family, finances, health, all kinds of things. But Jesus says, peace. Peace I leave with you. My peace, Jesus says. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world gives. <clears throat> the peace that Jesus offers to us is not in any way like what the world tries to pass off as peace. And they do that with countries, they do that with other nations, and there, there's all kinds of things floating around to try to give us peace in this life, in our lives, in this world. Doesn't help a whole lot sometimes. But Jesus says, I have a peace. And they had to think back. These apostles had to look back over the last three years that they had been with this person, that they had listened to Him, that they had followed Him, that they had seen the things that He did. They saw Him on the back of a boat in a, in a uh, hurricane-like situation, and He's back there laying down there asleep. I don't know that I could do that. You know, I've been on big ships, and I'm sure many of you have too. Bob was just talking about this the other day. Going through a storm and that ship going back and forth like this, back and forth. I didn't sleep a lot that night. But Jesus was back there asleep. He faced people who not only didn't agree with Him, I'm sure you've experienced that, He faced people that not only hated Him, maybe you've experienced that, he faced people that wanted to kill him. In fact, that's what all the religious leaders are wanting to do right now, and they do. And yet, he maintained a peace. And it was because of his relationship with God. It was because that he was seeking God's will in his life. And he was trusting 
God that no matter what took place, the Father was with him, the Father would lead him. And so now he says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world give I unto you. I've got this peace for you. Then he says, Let not your heart be troubled. Johnny, I believe I heard you say those words earlier today. Say them all the time. Amen. Let not your heart be troubled. That's tough sometimes to, to put into practice. To trust God through whatever you may be experiencing. So he says, peace, peace, we, <clears throat> we have his peace because of his pardon for us. Our sins are pardoned. How? By the blood of Jesus. Our sins are covered by the blood of Jesus. We are forgiven. That should bring peace to us. We also have his peace because of his presence. He is here. He is here right now in the midst of this group. His Holy Spirit is present in you if you are a believer. You have his presence that can bring peace at troubled times. And then we have peace from him because of his provision. He is providing for us daily, hourly, minute by minute in our lives, guiding, directing, providing as we live on this earth. But here he says, let not your heart be troubled. That's interesting that he says this because if you read chapter 13, if you read chapter 14, and if you read in chapter 15, he tells them, hey, I'm leaving. I'm going away. Well, I'm sure they didn't want to hear that. He says, where I'm going, you can't come. I'm sure they didn't want to hear that. He said, I'm giving, I'm, I'm giving you the Holy Spirit to be with you while I'm gone. I'm sure they didn't totally understand that. He said, they're going to do some things to me in the next few hours. They're going to take me. They're going to crucify me. On and on and on in these chapters, he gives them some things that make them wonder. They don't understand. They don't know what's going on. They don't know what's about to take place, and when they face it, they certainly don't have any answers. And so he tells them, all these questions, let not your heart be troubled. Now, we know the rest of that story. We know that he faces these things. He is arrested. He is tried. He is crucified. They put him in a tomb. And then we know the story about today. He is raised from the dead. He, he's in that resurrection. We know the rest of that story. And, and we come together today and we celebrate it and we... We shout hallelujah and sing praise to God because of the fact that yes, he died, but he lives again. And he's alive today. We know the rest of that story. They didn't. And you and I do not know the rest of our story. That's where we are today. We know what happened here. But I don't know the rest of my story. You don't know the rest of your story. And so I have questions. Probably you have some questions. Maybe you're facing some things right now that puts some fears within you. And you don't know what's going to happen. And Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled. Wow! What I need to hear today, what you need to hear today, and what we as not just individual believers, 
but what we as a family, and you, every believer here this morning is part of God's family, and I believe those of you who are here today are part of this family because God has brought you here and put you here. And that which draws us together, going back, is the blood of Jesus. You remember that song? What can wash away my sin? Nothing, Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. The song goes on. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me and you white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. That's how we love one another. Because each of us, each of you, here today, you matter. You matter to God. You matter to Jesus the Son who loved you and gave his life for you. And you matter to us today. May we stand.